Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Master Series, your guide to intelligent production brought to you by Entertainment Partners. I'm your host, Natalie Nelson. In the Master Series, we focus on important issues impacting the entertainment industry and its workers through in-depth discussion with legal, tax, payroll, technology, and production experts. Today, we are pleased to present the second episode in our series about film financing, and our expert panel will be discussing soft money financing. A few housekeeping items before we get started with today's discussion. First is that we encourage you to post questions for the panelists in the Q&A section of the Zoom call. You can do so by clicking the Q&A in the Zoom menu and you can submit your questions there and we'll save some time after the discussion to answer them. Also, please take 30 seconds to answer a short feedback survey after today's discussion. This includes the opportunity for you to give us feedback as well as to suggest topics for future webinars. Your feedback is very important to us, so 30 seconds is all that we ask. Now let's go ahead and meet today's panel. Today we are joined by Alexis Alexanian, Vice President of Business Development and Industry Relations here at Entertainment Partners. Alexis has over 25 years of film and television experience as an independent producer and production executive. She is a former president of production at Locomotive, known for projects including Maggie's Plan and Look Away, former president board of directors for New York Women in Film and Television, current treasurer of BAFTA New York, and co-founder of Indigent, producer producer of Sundance hits, Tadpoles, Pieces of April, and Personal Velocity. Also with us today is Melissa Wiseman, Tax Credit and Placement and Incentives Director here at Entertainment Partners. With over 20 years of experience in production accounting and production incentives, Melissa has worked in all major production incentive states, gaining knowledge in the top filming locations in the U.S. She is an active member of the Women in Film organization. She is former board chair of the New Orleans Video Access Center and former secretary of the Louisiana Film and Entertainment Association. She currently serves on the Institute of Professionals in Taxation Committee for the Credits and Incentives Symposium. Today's featured guest panelist is Vivian Hua, Executive Director of the Northwest Film Forum. Vivian is a writer, filmmaker, and organizer, and as the Executive Director of the Northwest Film Forum in Seattle, and the Editor-in-Chief of the interdisciplinary arts publication Redefine, much of their work unifies their metaphysical interests with their belief that art can positively transform the self and society. They are regular share... Um, excuse me, they regularly share human-centered stories through their storytelling newsletter, Ramblin' with V. In 2021, they plan to begin, begin production on an otherworldly comedy series entitled Reckless Spirit, and they are passionate about cultural space, the environment, and disrupting oppressive structures at vivianhua.com. And finally, today's moderator is John Hattity, Executive Vice President of the Incentives Group here at Entertainment Partners, where he specializes in the monetization of tax credits and minimum guarantees. John began his career at Orion Classics, a division of Orion Pictures, where he served as Technical and Administrative Director. He is former President and CEO of Hattity & Associates, a consultancy firm specializing in risk management and production finance, and he is also the former Executive Vice President of Motion Picture and Television Production Finance for Miramax Films. Recent finance projects include Snowden, American Made, and The Assistant. Panelists, welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are really excited to kick off this discussion on soft money financing. So, John, I'm going to invite you to uh, go ahead and get us started. Thank you and welcome everybody. And I wanna welcome my fellow panelists. Thank you for joining us on what is September 1st. I, can you believe it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're, we are here today to talk about soft money and um, you know, a lot of people ask, what, what is soft money? And the, I, I think the, um, the easiest way to describe it is it's free money. Now that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to spend some money in order to get that free money, um, but we're going to talk about that today. We're, we'll be talking about rebates, tax credits, grants, and discretionary funds. So let's. I'll start off. I'll I'll start off with with rebates. So, you know, 
pretty much everybody's familiar with a rebate, right? Manufacturer's rebate. You go into a store, you buy an air conditioner for $300 and you get a 10% rebate. So you get a check for $30 once you're actually able to prove that you spent the $300. Well, it, the same holds true for programs, rebate programs that are offered by government authorities. Um, but it's times, you know, 10,000, right? So you, you, you spend the money, you keep accurate records of the amount of money you've spent. There will be an audit of your expenses um, to, to prove that you did indeed spend what you said you were gonna spend, that you followed the guidelines, that you followed the rules, that you met any minimum thresholds that the government authority might require. And and once all of that is is proven true, then you'll get a rebate check. It's it's really just as simple as that. Of course, but the production accounting and financial reporting becomes the most crucial aspect of that. But I I, I would dare to say that the that rebate programs are probably the easiest to use as long as you follow the rules. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Alexis because I want Alexis to talk a little bit about refundable tax credits because Alexis has actually taken advantage of them. Okay, thanks, John. Um, a few years ago, I was president of production for a company, an independent film and television company that was positioned to finance and develop and produce um, content. We had a feature film that we didn't have enough funds to complete. And I remember listening to John speak at a PGA conference in New York and mentioning something about um, loans against a tax credit. So I called John and I said, this is my situation. We've actually completed the film. We're a few weeks into post and um, we don't have enough money to, to finish for a variety of reasons, which we don't have to go into. So um, I convinced my, my partners to uh, work with entertainment partners to take advantage of the fact that we had ticked all of the boxes necessary to uh, make good on that New York State incentive. Um, I also took advantage of EP's incentive administration because I was sort of left standing, the only person left standing to corral all of the necessary paperwork. I had had a patchwork of accountants. What happens sometimes, and maybe some of the people in the audience can relate to this, is when it's super busy, you may lose accountants to higher paying jobs, especially if you're doing a lower budget independent feature. So I was the only one really there to access the information and I benefited greatly, the film benefited greatly from the incentive admin because they helped us, they, they guided us towards flagging and tagging all of the necessary items to make, you know, make the most of, maximize that incentive. Um, it was also uh, somewhat of a relief to the investors to know that we were able to go down the road and take advantage of that robust New York State program, take advantage of EP's experts um, in admin, which, you know, I think saved us, I, you know, it's not an infomercial, but saved us tens of thousands of dollars uh, by, by, by helping us uh, through that process. So it was also good to know, and I mentioned this to many of my producer peers, that not only would EP fund against the tax uh, credit um, for production, but also, you, you know, for post. And I don't think a lot of people, you know, thought of it that way. So um, it's good to kind of highlight that. Let me, let me ask you something, Alexis, because you, you touched on something that actually is kind of a critical um, element to taking advantage of a, a, ref, a refundable tax credit, and that is the corporate structure. So you had mentioned that the investors um, saw this as a, as a potential early return Right, or partial return on their investment. Um, but depending on the corporate structure the production is using, the the refundable credit, well, let's even back up before that. So you, you know, just like the rebate, you spend all the money, there's an audit of your expenses, the final application is then sent into the state with the audit report, and then the state process it, right? The, the, they'll, they'll process right. the final application and issue a tax credit certificate. Now, because it's a refundable credit and not transferable credit, 
it means that the entity that actually that got the certificate has to file a tax return, right? And the extent to which they don't owe any tax, um, they'll get a refund check, right? In the amount of the credit mm-hmm. or or whatever is left of the credit after any taxes or outstanding taxes are paid. Now, if if a if the production entity is a C corp, and and therefore treat it as a corporation for tax purposes, then the check very easily the check gets cut back to that production entity. But a lot of producers um, use LLCs, right, as the production yeah. entity. And the way refundable credits work is the entity that earned the credit needs to file a tax return in that state, but then the the members of the LLC also need to file tax returns in that state, right? And the extent to which those members don't owe any tax in the state, then those individual members get individual checks with, that's, that's directly in line with their ownership interest in the LLC, right? You know so, if, John, I, yeah. I recall that, that we were set up, if, if memory serves, I recall that we were set up as an LLC, and I think that you talked us through the, uh, I think you're able to change at some, yep. at, at some time, right? So I think that, that we did shift from the LLC to the C Corp in order that, to. That's right. right. That's right. So you can file. So that's good I, to know too, right? That yeah, absolutely. So if you, so, so it is possible to correct that kind of midship because you can file IRS form 8832 and elect to be treated as a corporation for tax purposes. And then the check will go back to the entity and you won't have to chase individual investors to a, not only file a tax return, but chase them down for the money in order to reduce the cost of the picture. Right. Right. Great to know. Yeah. Um, And let's talk a little bit about timing. Um, You know, there are some states some states are much faster than others with respect to um, when you actually get that cash. You know, some states take longer than other states to process the final applications, to issue the final certificates, and actually to write the check. So it's really important that people understand what the timing actually is. And that's something that entertainment partners could certainly help producers with. Yes, um, it's it, my my experience. It seemed like EP uh, kept me and my partners abreast of how things were going with the state of New York. And I think it's probably, and I'm sure you and Melissa can speak to this. It's probably even more meaningful now that we're in this state of uh, you know Uber Uber not Uber drivers Uber um, <laughs> content creation right it's just yeah. so busy and so many producers are taking advantage of, advantage of incentives programs around the country um, so Absolutely. it's really important to understand that that timeline I think also I just want to add that I think sometimes producers have a you know a distorted view of how quickly that money is going to come back they're hoping they're praying they're counting on that and right. it really is important to get a reality check. That's right. And and actually, somebody did ask a question in the chat whether or not there was a, a version of EP in Canada. And yes, there certainly is. So at the same time that we have all these people on the ground in the states that are monitoring what happens in, in all of the states, in all of the 50 states, let alone internationally, um, we have a team in Canada that does the exact same thing. So there's a federal credit in Canada as well as provincial credits and regional credits. So, so yeah, we have our fingerprints on definitely all of North America and, and now the UK, but we're also monitoring all the incentive programs that exist around the world. Um, I, I want to uh, hop over to Melissa because Melissa um, specializes in transferable t- tax credits. And, and, you know, in general, I just I think it would be great if you would explain how a producer sells their tax credit. Absolutely. Thank you, John. And before we move on, I did want to go back to some items that you and Alexis were just speaking to, right? Um, I love, John, hearing you say, follow the rules. Um, Whether you're dealing with rebates, grants, 
you know, a, a transferable tax credit, credit or refundable tax credit. If you don't follow the rules, you're going to be very disappointed when it comes time to to get paid. So, as Alexis said, which you know it always warms my heart when Alexis talks about her work with our team. But you know, incentive management is very important, and I always like to say our fees pay for themselves. You know, Alexis said we save tens of thousands of dollars. I'll give you a real time example of this. We uh, recently had a project in Louisiana. And when I initially vetted their budget, they didn't think that insurance could qualify down there. And so, um, you know, I guided them and said, before you pay this, we need to look at what's local, use a local vendor for this provider. And we were able to get that, um, you know, vetted and paid correctly so that in the end, you know, we could get those monies back. So, um, and it's funny when Alexis says a distorted view of when you get the money back, um, you know, sometimes we have to let down producers when we are hired because they have to see when that date of payout may be, right? But it's crucial um, in your financial picture. Um, so if John's lending against a tax incentive, he needs to know how long it's going to be and how, you know, how far out that loan is going to be outstanding. So th those are just some things before I get on my soapbox about transferable tax credits that I wanted to um, mention as they were just speaking about. It, but productions typically don't generate any income tax liability within the state. Why are we talking about that? Well, if you have a tax credit, you have to sell it to someone at a discounted rate that does have liability in the state. That might be a high net worth individual or a large co corporation. We have a great video on our website under our tax credit placement at ep.com. This video at the bottom of that webpage is a great explanation of how these credits work. But what does that mean to your bottom line? Well, it means that just because you have a tax credit you earned of $100,000, dollars, you will only net maybe $88,000, depending on how much you sell it for. So again, producers get frustra frustrated when they want to know pricing, right, of how much they can sell these transferable tax credits for. But here at EP, we like to say we try to match buyers and sellers for a mutual beneficial outcome. Um, and what does that mean? Well, there are a lot of factors that go into price point. So, you know, when will the tax credit be ready for sale? What is the tax year of your credit? What is the production company's tax year? Do they have to file a tax return before trading the credit? All of these are factors that go into it because, you know, if I know that your credit is going to be ready in time for individual tax payers. So uh, let's use Georgia as an example. So typically in Georgia, this is May 15th of when, you know, these high net worth individuals would file their taxes. I may be able to get a better price point versus going to a company that has a fiscal year of, say, September 30th. You know, they would likely pay less because there's not much of a need there. Um, and when we talk about price, I also want you to know your net price that you're getting. What does that mean? Well, net price means whomever is going to help you sell this credit and introduce you to these taxpayers that need the tax credit to lower their income tax um, liability within the state, then they're going to take a fee for that. So I get calls a lot that say, but I'm, they're telling me I'm getting 90 cents per dollar. Well, is that, are you really getting 90 cents per dollar or are you getting maybe 87 cents, 88 cents after they take their fee? So that's something to be mindful of um, when you get into these conversations. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to mention when we talk about transferable tax credits is market fluctuation. Georgia is a perfect example of this. So going back to producers getting frustrated, they'll call me and say, what do I budget? How much can I sell this tax credit for? Well, it really depends on a lot of those factors and will it will be ready. You know, in previous years, say 2017, 2019, there was a large number of credits on the market for sale in Georgia, which made the price go down significantly. Well, present day, it is definitely a seller's market. With the lull in the 2020 productions due to COVID, tax taxpayers are actively seeking for these credits, which is driving up the price. It's supply and demand. Also, there was a recent legislative change um, making the tax share of the credit based upon certification versus year spent. So I'm expecting in Georgia, this will add another lull in the market, driving price up a little bit more. Well, so and, and, can I just jump in a quick second? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
just from with my producer hat on, you know, I, I've never uh, worked through uh, the buying and selling of those credits. What would be your advice to independent producers if they are going to work in a state where they can't take advantage of that credit and they need to find a, a buyer? Um, what's the timing like? How far in advance should they be researching this part of it? Because it, it sounds like you have it. I know you have it all under control, but it sounds a little complicated and that there are a lot of factors. When's the best time for people to get started on that process? Yeah, so they'll want to know once they start budgeting right um, mm-hmm. for that particular jurisdiction what the price point is and i always like to tell them you want to be as conservative as possible so you'll be pleasantly surprised in the end right so when you start sure. budgeting you need to know those price points right once you have your funding you know yes i will be shooting in georgia or illinois or connecticut you know one of the transferable tax credit states then your your greenlit you have your funding you know it's a go you've applied to the program. Um, Hopefully EP's helped you with that part of it. Then we can go ahead and we can start marketing those credits to our buyers because then we have a good solid understanding once your funding is in place of when that credit will be ready. And depending on the market, we can also get into pre-purchase agreements. Um, You know, right now, Georgia, it's very hard to get a pre-purchase agreement because like I said, it's a seller's market. So they don't want to lock in any pricing because they feel like they can try to get that extra penny or so, you know, as the market Mm -hmm. ticks up. But say Illinois or Connecticut, for example, those are states where I can get in pre-purchase agreements. They, um, you know, those are very desirable credits. And so our, you know, our buyers want to go ahead and lock in those credits that they they know they can plan for in the future. Um, And what's interesting about this, and it's something you should know going into it, if you're lending against that tax credit, and you have a lender that is requiring a buyer before they will close the loan, that's something you're going to have to line up. So in order to close your funding package, then you'll need to be in one of those pre-purchase agreements. Does that Thank help, you. Alexis? Yes. What, no, I think that's have your producer vivid. hat on? Yes. <laughs> and Melissa, is there, are there any corporate structure considerations that need to be taken into account when, when a production is being set up for a transferable state? Um, There's not necessarily a lot of entity structuring that goes into it. I I will say something you need to know is for Georgia, for example, you need to know exactly what your tax year is because that's indicative of the application, right? uh, And it's the tax year of the production entity earning the credit. But you're going to have to know at the end of the production and when all your expenses are complete, you have to register that tax credit through what's called uh, the Georgia Tax Center. And you have to know whether that entity is disregarded and it will roll up to the parent entity or if you will be because you're going to have to file a tax return. So you're going to need to know those particulars before you can sell the credit because you have to register it either with the entity that's filing the tax return. So that's something very specific to Georgia that I always like to point out. Right. And I, and I remember actually work uh, a few years back, we had lent against a California credit. Mm-hmm. And when it came time to actually transfer the credit to the buyer, right. we had to uh, report all the social security. It was an LLC. And the, the California needed to know the social security numbers of every member of the LLC, um, which which actually was quite a daunting task considering yes, <laughs> there are over 24 <laughs> 24 members and even some of those members were S corps or right. LLC. So it was, it was a quite a chore. So anyway. Yeah. But, it, yeah and that's ahead. a good, I uh, thank you for um, reminding me of that. Um, I, I block that out of my mind sometimes because that was a, of a really sticky part. Right. But um, it's called the franchise tax board, which is like California's department of revenue. And so the franchise tax board needs to know all of those socials. So again, that's another good example kind of going back to entity structuring for New York when it's a refundable tax credit. If you can elect to be a C-Corp, then you won't have the issue of having to disclose that. Um, you know, right. I just remember vividly thinking, I have whose social security number? Right. <laughs> well, and also, yeah, yeah. I mean, and also you know, there's another solution too that, that would preserve the tax um, treatment for the individual investors 
and also I kind of put them at an arm's length in the production. And that is the, the rights for the project could certainly be held by an LLC and, and the, the LLC could, could enjoy the, the revenue stream. Um, but a, a C Corp could be set up just to be the production entity and be the applicant for the credit. And then uh, there would just be a production service agreement between right. the LLC and the C Corp and a one picture license that would give the right to make the film to the LLC, uh, to the C Corp, just for purposes of making and delivering the project back up to the owner, which would be the LLC. And in that way, you'd be able to keep all the investors at an arm's length from what's happening at the production level. So it's something something to consider. And who says entity structuring is not sexy, John? That's, that's <laughs> right. I, I just have to add that what I used to say to filmmakers was if they're nearly ready to go, what, what two things do you have to do? Call a good entertainment attorney and call EP. So, you know, that's right. we could wait, wait through all of that yep. tax and uh, financing. Right. Um, so I, I also want to point out, and while we're talking about tax credits, just briefly, that there are tax credits that are offered in some jurisdictions that are not refundable and they're not transferable, which means that you're going to get a tax credit certificate for an entity that may or may not have any tax liability. You know, as Melissa said earlier, you know, produ th these production entities usually are set up as special purpose vehicles. They don't really own any assets. They're not going to have any income. Um, and so that tax credit that you've earned m may just you may have to just surrender it. Um, so it's important to, uh, uh, again, understand what is that, that you're, what incentive is this? Like, what, what does it look like? What does it feel like? How do I use it? What's the end game 18 months, 24 months from now? Um, all right, so that, that being said, I wanna move on to what I think is like one of the most exciting um, elements of soft money and that is grants. I think grants are, um, gosh, there's just a variety, a variety of grants that are available and, and really all over the world. Um, but Vivian, in particular, I want Vivian and Alexis to talk about the grants that, um, that they are most familiar with, and then we'll, we'll have a little broader discussion. So Vivian, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, so, hey, I'm Vivian. I'm with Northwest Film Forum. We're in Seattle, which is Duwamish land. Um, and our recent grant is called the Lynn Shelton of a Certain Age Grant. And we started it two years ago now. This is the second year um, in collaboration with the Duplass Brother Productions um, in honor of the late filmmaker Lynn Shelton, who had a deep history with our cinema. Um, and it's a pretty specific grant. It's um, project based, provides $25,000 to an individual woman, non-binary or transgender um, U.S. filmmaker aged 39 years or older who is working on their first narrative feature for the first time as a director. It's like very specific um, because of we really want to honor Lynn's legacy and made the grant in that way. Um, I do want to start off by saying that um, our grant obviously is just one type of grant. And as John mentioned, there's so many kinds um, and ours is unrestricted in the sense that we do not ask people to give us a budget. We don't like require the money to be used for a certain thing specifically, um, even though people are applying for a production that they're working on. Um, there are many other kinds that are, you know, for pre-production or post-production or production itself, um, all kinds of things. And there are also grants that are foundation-based or through city, state, government, et cetera. Um, ours is a very like grassroots, individual, private donors, like supporting this grant sort of situation. Um, and I will just speak briefly to kind of like what we're looking for with this grant. In addition to the criteria, we're very much wanting to support people who have um, a strong storytelling voice that is very singular, um, in addition to like a strong work history and portfolio that we can look at. and we want to support people that um, the money will clearly make a big difference in their career and, and put them to that next level, ideally. And Vivian, what's the application process look like, feel like? Yeah, so last year we did a nomination-based process and this year we opened it up, even though it's a little more logistical on our end, just um, in the name of equity and to be able to, because if you do a nomination-based process, often you have to know someone and that's not as accessible for people who might just be like reading about it. Um, so we try to simplify the form as much as possible. Um, and it is 
pretty straightforward for the first round. It's a, a couple work samples. Um, one is a past work sample of a short. One is one for the project that you're working on. And then some director statements, project statements, kind of stereotypical stuff. Um, and then if you get to the next round, we'll ask for a longer work sample and a, a deeper statement of why you're making the work and why you're the one who should be telling this particular story at this time. So Vivian, Alexis, I was just going yeah, oh, to ask Vivian on that, on that line of thinking, um, what, what do you see often or what, what advice do you have for some of the uh, producers who are submitting an application? Or, do you see some mistakes that are commonly made? I, I also think when you tell people what, what you need, it's also good to tell them what doesn't always resonate. So mm. if you have any advice, um, any advice for uh, completing applications, um, yeah, I think kind of the same with any good film pitch, you know, getting really clear on who you are and why you're doing it is really like the number one advice um, and what makes you special and your film special. So that's definitely what we're looking for. Um, I will also mention we are in also in the name of equity, um, allowing not just written statements, but also video and audio, because when we did some focus groups, um, it was uh, pretty like overwhelming that everyone thought it was a good idea to include that. And we do definitely see uptake on that too, which is like pretty interesting. Alexis, you, 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 you've had actually experience with a couple similar um, grant programs. Maybe you talk about um, Nywift and Sloan for us. Sure. You know, this, um, the whole uh, sort of nonprofit grant giving area was, uh, you know, something I was not familiar with for a very long time, having worked on, uh, studio films before becoming an independent producer. But when I joined the board of New York Women in Film and Television, NYWIFT, I learned a lot more about filmmakers trying to piece together money to get their projects and move their projects forward. So my immediate experience with NYWIFT um, and the grants um, is, is really interesting. There are a number of women who either they they've earmarked money that they have uh, or they've come into some money and they realize that this is uh, a way of giving back, a way of supporting um, female filmmakers at various stages of their career. So, you know, the Ravenel Family Foundation is a grant. The um, Nancy Malone was a, I don't know if you ever knew her, John, but she was a wonderful um, actress and early television director in LA and um, wanted to earmark money for the distinct purpose of helping to elevate women um, working at various stages of their career. And as Vivian pointed out, some of these grants are really very specific. You know, uh, at NYWIFT, we targeted, we noticed that, for example, women had a tough time making their second feature and that they needed real money, not only to make the feature, but then to, to be in all the places where you might be to get that feature um, in front of a distributor. So, you know, there's money earmarked for marketing and festivals and promotion and that type of thing. Um, you know, there, there's uh, money earmarked for various age groups. Um, there's also the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which is an amazing, amazing organization where uh, Doron Weber, get, you know, earmarks money for various colleges um, and universities and film programs there. Also at festivals, they give out grants. I mean, their mandate is more or less to elevate the, um, the sciences, math, technology. Um, so any scripts that, that center around those topics are really uh, critical to, the, uh, to that mission. Um, and then you find like at the festivals for a long time, and I know that due to COVID, some of the, uh, you know, like Tribeca Film Institute and maybe IFP and Women in Film in LA, I think that they're are some um, institutions that have kind of taken a pause in their grant programs, trying to figure out what the COVID effect has been. I don't know, Vivian, if, if that's familiar to you too. And then they're, they're sort of reevaluating and regrouping, but I think it's really important to, to think creatively about putting the money pieces together for your project and who might have a vested interest in your topic or in you, uh, you know, uh, or your voice. And you'd be surprised. I recently um, worked with some documentary filmmakers who uh, have been shooting a ton of footage and 
everybody needs money at various you know intervals of the process and uh we came upon jewish story partners and they were able to get a, a you know an important grant from them um so there are all kinds of niches and places to to look to look for money there are, and we actually are, are going to be sharing a link, actually several links, um, with the audience to, um, to, to to show them where they can find um, some of these programs. I mean, and look, they're not just in the U.S. Canada has a number of programs, grant programs that are available to Canadian filmmakers. Um, there are uh, grant programs in the U.K. There are a number of them available to European producers throughout Europe. Um, so, you know, we'll, we're a right. wonderful resource when it comes to kind of finding that and, money. And I have to mention the Sundance Institute because clearly they've been doing this type of work for decades. And so I would just encourage everyone to look at the websites of some of these industry nonprofits, um, you know, industry organizations and the festivals themselves to try to locate um, some information on these grants. That's right. And John, somebody in the chat had uh, is in Vancouver and was asking specifically about, you know, a micro budget. So what are some of those programs in Canada? Do you know offhand? Well, Telefilm is a perfect example, right? Telefilm Canada it, it provides grants to to productions. I, I'm not sure if the grant is intended to be repaid if the project gets made. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but you know, again, it's it's one of those uh, situations where you really need to understand going in. How does it work? What are the rules? How how am I eligible? And you know, what is what does it look like eighteen months from now, twenty months from now, um, when the project actually gets set up and made? Um, do I have any reporting obligations? Do I have any any um, progress reports that I need to do um, in order to access that money. So, um, you know, I would say the best resource is probably going to be the film commission um, or um, places like the Canadian Film uh, Canadian Film Center. Um, where a lot of graduates um, have become quite successful filmmakers and have taken advantage of some of the programs there. There's also a Greenberg Fund that, I mean, when, when I, almost every in, little independent Canadian film that's crossed my desk had money from the Greenberg Fund. And, and I actually wanted to meet Mr. Greenberg <laughs> because I was like, who is this guy who's financing all these movies? And it turns out that he's, he's deceased, but um, the fun lives on. So yeah, there are lots of, lots of resources available. You know, um, what somebody actually uh, fortunately put in the chat as an answer to telefilm, they offer a combination of grant funding and equity financing. Their various programs at various budget levels have different options. So there you go. Um, you know, I, I also want to talk about discretionary funds very briefly because they do exist. Um, and I have on occasion in the course of my career actually gone to government authorities and asked if there were discretionary funds available to help support the financing of a project because either there wasn't an incentive offered in that jurisdiction or the incentive that was being offered was not compelling enough for me to bring that production to that jurisdiction. And, and I can tell you, now it's on, I can count on one hand the number of times I was successful, but I was successful in, in, in a few occasions where I, in, in one instance, it was a grant from the Board of Tourism, um, all in the um, interest of trying to create awareness about that jurisdiction. Um, one, one grant was actually from the Department of Economic Development because it, 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 we were underscoring the importance of creating jobs and creating training programs for people in that jurisdiction. And in one case, it, we got an, we got discretionary funds from a governor out of the governor's discretionary funds because the governor thought it would be an embarrassment if that particular story was not made in his state. So I, you know, I, I don't be afraid to ask, right? I'm always like, if you don't ask, you don't get. So, 
I think that, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's really, you know, and, and these people are, are very accessible when you're talking about creating jobs and dumping money into the local economy, they're going to take your call. So, you know, I, I don't think any challenge is too great. So. Donna, it just reminded me of um, upstate New York and some of the interesting pockets of uh, upstate where they have, per, you know, specific arts organizations that earmark money, as you mentioned, like economic impact. If you're able to shoot in a certain jurisdiction, let's say Syracuse or central New York, right? Okay. That's one program in particular that I know you're, you're familiar with. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there are these, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens in, in these jurisdictions are on a state level or a country level in the case of international um, credits and incentives. But there are also regional incentives, right, as there are all over the world. So uh, New York is a great example. Central New York Arts, CNY, uh, CNY Arts, actually offers an incentive that can be coupled with the New York State incentive to get people to move their productions to central New York, right? And so you're, you're getting, um, in essence, you're getting rewarded for creating jobs and spending money in a particular region of the state. You know, we've seen that in Georgia, we've seen that in California. Uh, so it, it's, it's um, yes, it's something that's absolutely worth looking at. And certainly all over the UK. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I know that somebody in the chat had mentioned something about the UK and Maybe you and Melissa want to touch on that for a minute in terms of uh, what EP does for Europe and the UK in terms of incentives and things. Yeah, I mean, we look, we, we were very familiar with the incentives all, all over the world. Um, we and, and the UK has a very valuable incentive. Um, and, and there are in some cases, there is a BFI, British Film Institute money available in some circumstances. Um, the you know, but and I, I don't know if there are regional. There uh, are, there are. We, the we looked into that too. At, yes, okay. yes. Um, similarly to the, the New York State. Um, right. I don't know why I can't think of it right now, but sort of the north of England and the Midlands and various regions right. oh, have that's specific, great. or they used to. So it's worth, the point is, it's just worth digging in. You have to kind of do your homework. Right. right? That's right. That's right. And a good resource for, for things like that, too, would be the British Film Commission. Sure. I did. I did want to point out about doing your homework. So, you know, when John talks about these discretionary funds, you do want to be mindful. So say you're getting a grant from the state of Louisiana and you go to you're also going to file for the tax credit there. They're going to ask questionnaires at the end of payout of have you received any other monies from the state? So just be mindful. Some jurisdictions do not want you double dipping, per se, if you've already gotten, you know, money from the state um, in certain instances, then you just need to be mindful of that if you're, you know, going for it. Um, and, you know, as, as I speak, you know, I reference Louisiana so much because I spent so much time down there. But, you know, one of the things that I think is such a great program is the Louisiana Film Price it, Prize. It's a great film festival that's up in Shreveport. Um, it's all based on short films, but the prize winner is $25,000, which can go a very long way for your next film, right? Um, and to me, short films are always very fun. But Louisiana Film Prize brags that they are the largest, you know, cash prize a festival and it is a a great, you know, for the northern Louisiana area, as so many productions are centralized in Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, and Novak, as was mentioned um when I was being introduced, is a great supporter of this festival um back when I served on their board. That's New Orleans Video Access Center. Which brings me to um, New Orleans Video Access Center can be a fiscal sponsor, which is needed for some of the grant programs. And did you cover that earlier, John, with Vivian, if that grant needs a fiscal sponsor? I could, no, sorry. We, we actually we haven't talked about that yet. Yeah. Um, so and, and actually, you know, that's a great question to ask, Melissa, because you're teeing up our next our next um, okay. uh, in the series, which is on hybrid financing. But but it, it's it's worth and hybrid financing, as we'll we'll explain in the next session, 
is a, a, using a combination of for-profit funds and not-for-profit funds, right? Which may, makes it a hybrid. But you know, Vivian, that would be a great. Um, uh, it, it is a great question to pose to you. So in in your and Alexis too, are fiscal sponsors a, actually needed in order to access the grant funds you talked about? Yeah, yeah, it really depends on the grant you're applying for. Our grant does not require that, but there are a lot from larger um, funders who might require you, especially I feel like state um, or government entities often right. require fiscal sponsorship. And fiscal sponsorship, for those who don't know, is um, basically a nonprofit takes you under their wing and uses um, their nonprofit umbrella to let you fundraise for your film. So we do that in Northwest Film Forum where um, we help a lot of filmmakers fundraise through our nonprofit status. And we just have like fundraising links for them to share out and whatnot. Great, NIWIF does that too. And so do uh, a number of the um, other industry nonprofit organizations. But you said that's coming up next week, right, John? Or in well, a not next weeks? week. The, yeah, the, 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 next, the next in the series is on hybrid financing. So we'll, okay. we'll do a deep dive on, on how to take advantage of that. Um, so with that being said, I wanted, I wanted to make sure that we left a few minutes for some questions. Um, so, Natalie, why don't you, um, you... You've got access to all of them. Why don't you... Thank you, John. Yes, sorry, unmuting myself. Uh, we did get quite a few questions, so we're going to take a few now. So the first one is um, someone wrote in and asked, can acquiring soft money be disruptive to my production plan? Um, so any of you would like to jump in on that or John, do you maybe want to take that one? Yeah, I, it, it absolutely can be, right? So, and so again, it goes back to understanding the rules, right? There may be certain thresholds you need to, to meet. You may, you may only be eligible for an incentive if a certain percentage of your spend happens on the ground in that jurisdiction, or if a certain percentage of your crew or, or local hires, um, you know, so if you're a production that, you know, had in, a, in their head that they wanted to bring in a whole bunch of people from New York, or California, mm -hmm. you know, to go someplace else, um, you may find yourself ineligible for the incentive if you haven't met the in, the employee threshold. So yes, it, it can absolutely be disruptive, and and um, it, it is. So it's very important that you um, understand everything that is going to be required of the production in order to actually qualify for the incentive you're chasing. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, I know, I know we've talked about different types of, uh, of films that people are making, but um, we got a question about documentaries and is soft money really available for documentaries or is it reserved for any specific type of a production? Certainly, There's, there are a lot of entities out there. Um, and I think Sundance Institute had or may still have a documentary fund and Jewish Story Partners, as I mentioned, um, uh, there, uh, there are, they're out there. I can't name them. Yeah, yeah hands, absolutely. But. Yeah, there are grant programs that are available. There are also, um, if you go to our the production incentives website, you you can actually see which which states do offer the incentive to documentaries. Uh, we break it down. We tell you all the different um, forms of media that are eligible for the incentive. So you know, for instance, New York. In New York, documentaries don't don't um, qualify for the New York state tax credit, but you know, Pennsylvania does, right? So, I mean, you just have to look at the state and, and scroll down and see um, what's available in those jurisdictions. And again, there are, there are lots of sources uh, for grants and, and again, they'll be, they'll be put up in the chat, um, but there are grants available for documentaries. Perfect. Thank you. And I did just drop a lot of the uh, the links that we referenced in today's discussion into the chat. So I encourage everyone to uh, to copy those down, take a screenshot, whatever works best for you. Um, staying on this kind of topic of what type of production, what about um, animation features? Is the financing approach any different for that? What types of financing are available for that? Well, there again, not not unlike what, what we just talked about, if there are certain jurisdictions that that do recognize animation as uh, an animation, it would be, you know, family animation, adult animation, it, it, anim animation is animation in the in the eyes of the state authorities. So um, as long as it's not pornography, right? So um, there are some jurisdictions that 
um, do recognize animation and there are jurisdictions that don't. There are also special um, special incentives that have been written in Canada, in Europe, um, in the UK, specifically for visual effects and animation. Um, so, you know, the, this is stuff that's really um, important to, to scout. All right. So it looks like this is going to be our last question as we are coming close to the end of the hour. Um, and this one is, what are the pitfalls or challenges of combining types of film funds from several different areas? May they be countries or, or otherwise? Well, Vivian, let me ask you, I mean, when you look, when you are looking at projects um, that you're considering uh, for the Lynn Shelton grant, uh, is is it have can productions commingle those funds with other funds um, that the producer may have received? For our grant, absolutely, um, and I feel like most grants probably because they aren't largely that much money. Ours is pretty hefty at twenty five k, but I feel like most grants are much smaller, like five k, one k. So I think they're used to them mixing with other funds for sure. Right, Alexis. What have what's been your experience? I think um, I think it's uh, like anything else. You, you sort of have to take a look at and come up with a plan and make sure that that things are copacetic. That you look to see that you have to read the fine print. You know, as Melissa was saying, right. in doing your homework, um, it's really important. And it's also important to be clear with your funders, with your other funders, that this is part of your plan. Because uh, what I've bumped into is, you know, dare I say, a little bit of a desperation that that um, independent producers may have. And they're really looking to get um, another, uh, you know, a trailer cut or get to a next um, edit. And they don't have the money for that. And so I think it's important to, like, just take a, a real solid look at all of those funders and make them aware that, um, you know, I'm now going out for this grant and I'm going to add that to the pool, um, which is a whole other conversation too about what you do in return, you know, credits right. that you give out for people and other obligations that you might have based on the, you know, restrictions of the grant. So it's really good to not just have a knee jerk reaction, but to really take a look and see how they sit side by side with other types of money and, how, how your main investors may feel about, you know, putting together those, those pieces of, of funding. Right. I will say uh, on, on an international level, um, there are some challenges and pitfalls. It's v if, if, for instance, you're doing an official co-production under a co-production treaty and several two or more countries are involved, then there are challenges and there are um, rules and restrictions that you absolutely need to follow if you want to access the soft money. And we're not going to go into detail about that now because mm -hmm. also in our master series, we're going to do a whole session on international film financing and we will address that. But but that that does pose a number of challenges which are surmountable as long as you know the rules. Right. Planning is important. Yes. <laughs> and getting good advice is important. Yes, absolutely. So Entertainment Partners is here to help. Certainly lots of good advice coming yeah. from all of you today. So thank you panelists so much for sharing all of your, in your insights and your expertise on these different areas of soft money. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions for our panelists. We did only have time to get to a few, but if you would like to keep the discussion going, you can certainly do so over at the productioncommunity.com. We have a wonderful forum where you can post questions and our experts will be sure to get answers to you in short order. And if you would like to revisit today's webinar, along with the complete library of Master Series episodes, you can do so at ep.com slash Master Series. We have over 50 episodes available for, for viewing on demand at any time, and we encourage you to check all of those out. And while you are over at ep.com, we do encourage you to also head over to the production incentives pages, which Melissa and John referenced during our webinar today, which is your destination for all things related to production incentives 
incentives. You can explore the latest news in incentives. You can visit our jurisdiction comparison tool and our incentives estimator to see just how much your production can save. Our team of experts can also help you with incentives administration and tax credit placement. And you can connect with John and Melissa and the rest of our incentives group to ensure that your production gets the best incentive and financing guidance in the industry. We also encourage everyone to head over to my.ep.com, which is where production workers in the U.S. can access their last three years of U.S. EP pay information. You can compare week over week changes if anything may be different, and you can update your personal profile if you happen to relocate so we have your accurate mailing information. It is also your destination to purchase the new movie Magic Budgeting, which is available for download now with a one month free trial. And you can also access our e-learning academy. The EP Academy has over a dozen courses available, including production accounting courses, as well as courses in our various different uh, technology solutions, which is set up to help you level up on your skills and take that next step in your career, or do a little refresher if you may be out of practice with any, su any subject or any technology. So we encourage you to join the thousands of members who have already signed up at my.ep.com and utilize our resources today. A special thank you goes out to all of today's panelists and our audience for joining us. We hope that you all stay safe and healthy, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Master Series. Mm -hmm.